Ma'am. You know what, thank you. He almost stuck us on the deathbed. He had to leave and go to Florida. Oh, no. That's, did not know that. All right. Remind me. I don't have any place to write it right now. Remind me in, the, in there and I, if I don't... If I don't remember. All right, Romans chapter seven. We spent last we spent last week in a discussion of Paul's uh, statements with regard to the law and its relationship with marriage. And by relationship, what I mean is is that Paul was using marriage as an illustration to show how the Jews had been released from the law of Moses. And so and and the point the first point that I wanted to make and did make is is that Romans 7 is not presented as a new or Pauline teaching on marriage. Rather Paul is using God's ideal for marriage, in other words, what God has always intended for marriage, which is one man, one woman for life. That's always been, that's always been God's ideal, God's standard. And he's simply holding that up as the example of how the Jews could leave their relationship with the law of Moses without sin and certainly without any uh, uh, pangs of guilt. And the, and, the, and the teaching is that when a woman is married to a man, when he dies, she's freed from that, from that man. And then she's free, to, she's free to be married to another because he's dead and death severs that relationship. And so Paul goes on to say, likewise, you also reckon yourselves dead uh, to the law. There in um, verse 4. Through the body of Christ, that you might be married to another, even him who was raised from the dead, that you should bear fruit unto God. And so Paul makes it clear that the old law is comparable to a dead husband. And, and that that husband cannot be held on to because death has severed that relationship. But unlike a unlike a... A human relationship where when the husband dies, the wife is not required to find another husband. Paul is using this to show that it's right, good and right for them to seek a relationship with Jesus. And that that relationship with Jesus supersedes that relationship that they had with the old law. And so uh, Paul is just simply holding up God's ideal for marriage, his the, the plan that he always had from the very beginning that Jesus referenced in Matthew 19 when he went all the way back to Genesis 2, and he's simply holding up that imagery to show or illustrate how the old law is dead and they are no longer bound to it in any way. And then we close by talking about the idea of bearing fruit uh, unto, uh, uh, bearing fruit What's it say there in verse uh, 4? That we might bear fruit to God. And the, the point there is not does not have anything to do with childbearing, but rather has to do with the result of living your life as a Christian. Because Paul had just finished, I mean like two sentences earlier, had just finished talking about what fruit did you have in those things in which you are now ashamed. In other words, what was the produce? What, what resulted from your former life in which you are now ashamed? And so the word fruit there just simply means, you know, what are you producing? And Paul says that now, being married to Christ, we can bear fruit unto God. Whereas you couldn't bear fruit unto God under the old law because it's been done away with. Now you can bear fruit unto God under this new relationship or in this new relationship uh, that you have uh, with, uh, with Christ. And note you know, the, the imagery that you might be married to another. Married to another. And, and that's an important imagery because marriage is a permanent relationship and lasts until, again, till what? Death. 
And so when we're married, you know, when we're joined to Christ, we're married to Christ, the only thing, the only thing that would sever that relationship in, in, a, in a formal way would be death. Well, Jesus is not going to die. And so, in other words, we are joined to Christ until we die. And, and of course, then we know that when we die, we go to, to the to the Hadean realm, to, to paradise, and, and await, the, uh, await the second coming of Jesus because he's going to come back and he's going to gather up all those that are in his kingdom and deliver them to God the Father. All right, now, question number five. Question number five is verse number six. It says, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of what? The spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now, um, the newness of the spirit versus the oldness of the letter is a contrast uh, between the new relationship that we have in Christ, newness of, in the Spirit, versus the oldness of the letter, which is the law, the, 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 the written law, the law written uh, and engraved in stone. And so uh, it, Paul, is not, Paul is not trying to diminish the old law or in any way, um, you know, throw shade at the old law. He's simply saying that the new law it far supersedes uh, the, this, old, uh, this old law. It's the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Uh, one might also consider um, that uh, a relationship with the Holy Spirit is involved in our uh, Christian uh, covenant, whereas no relationship is ever set forth uh, in, under the old law. And so, in that sense, it's a you know there's, it's a law that we are under now that is uh, tied to the Holy Spirit, uh, and that we are also tied to the Holy Spirit individually because we're baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and so there's a relationship that is that is born uh, out of our obedience in baptism. Uh, note again the imagery of the Christian being dead and not the law. Uh, but again, it's dead to, you know, we're, we're dead to that. Obviously, we can't be dead and marry or be joined to someone else. And then also note, and, that, and I'm using the New King James, which I told you sometimes I don't get it right when I'm writing the questions out. But if you're using a New King James, you'll notice there are certain capitalizations uh, of pronouns that are pronouns that are not at the beginning of a sentence and would naturally be capitalized. And those capitalizations are, uh, are um, supplied by the translators because they believe that those pronouns refer to deity. In other words, if somewhere in the middle of a, the middle of a sentence you find the word he that's capitalized or him that's capitalized somewhere in the middle or end of the sentence, it means that pronoun refers to some form of deity. You know, uh, you know, in him you have redemption through his blood, the remission of sins, Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, if you read that in the New King James, in him, him would be capitalized. All right. Another thing we have to remember is this. When you read the word spirit in your New Testament, sometimes it's capitalized and sometimes it's not capitalized. Now, most of the time, that the, the, the reference of the spirit as, a, as to the Holy Spirit is clear. In other words, uh, like uh, the... Well, like in this passage that we're looking at here, it's not so clear. But my point is, is that most of the time when you see a capital S spirit, it means Holy Spirit. But the translators are capitalizing it. In other words, it's not the, the Greek New Testament was not written in capitals, you know, with uppercase and lowercase. All the letters were the same. And so it's a it's a translator uh, judgment. 
if spirit is the Holy Spirit or if it's the spirit of man, you know, uh, or, you know, some other spirit like an evil spirit. And so you know, the word, that word can be used in a lot of different contexts. Now, note here in um, uh, the end of the first line, capitalization of the words like spirit are subject to the influence of the translators. Again, many references to the spirit clearly refer to the Holy Spirit, even when lacking identifying phrases like of God, like spirit of God, spirit of the Lord. Uh, an example would be Matthew 4 and verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Well, we know that Spirit's the Holy Spirit. All right? This appearance of Spirit, the Spirit uh, uh, of the, um, uh, the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter, this appearance of the word Spirit is not as clear. Now, you know, I'm, in, I'm, inclined to be, I'm inclined to believe that it could be the Holy Spirit or there might kind of be a double meaning here intended. But, uh, but just, look at the, just look at the note and we'll walk through it. Most translations, New King James, New American Standard, English Standard, NIV, capitalize Spirit to make it refer to the Holy Spirit. But the King James Version... And the American Standard Version do not capitalize spirit. All right? Now, the, un, the uncapitalized spirit of the latter is correct, I think, on a couple of fronts. First is the contrast to the flesh and spirit in verses 5 and 6, and the contrast later summarized in verse 25, um, where it says... Uh, Well, look at verse 25 in chapter 7. Somebody look at that in the... in the. Uh, somebody got King James open? Somebody got King James Bible open? All right. Does it say, So then with the Spirit I myself serve the law? Yeah. So then with the mind. Oh, so it's with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um... Okay, I, I thought there might be the word spirit in 25, but Paul is contrasting two things here, which is what I was getting at. Second, the capitalization seems to me to imply a lack of the Spirit's influence in the giving of the old law. What I mean by that is, if Spirit is holy... How, how am I going to say this? If Spirit refers to the Holy Spirit it might all, almost imply or we might incorrectly infer that the Holy Spirit had nothing to do with the old law. And that would not be true. You know, the Holy Spirit had, you know, had a role in giving the old law. I mean, what does, you know, what does 1 Peter say or 2 Peter say in chapter 1? It says, no scripture is of any private interpretation. It says, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, David, I believe it was, said, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and His word was in my tongue. And so the Holy Spirit was involved in the giving of the Old Testament and the Old Law. And so I, I'm inclined to think that, that Paul is not trying to contrast the Holy Spirit as being strictly a New Testament uh, phenomena separated from the Old Testament. Uh, then, um, I, I already gave you 2 Peter 1, I, I mentioned that, and then 2 Samuel 23, 2 is the, the mention I, I just gave you of David. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His word uh, was in my tongue. And so, uh, we have to be careful. We have to be careful when we, when we see certain words, uh, when we understand that um, it's under the influence of translators. Now look, I'm not saying if it is the Holy Spirit in this text that, that, that it, it separates the new from the old with the Holy Spirit. I'm just saying it seems to make more sense to me contrasting the, the spirit of man with the flesh of man. All right, question six comes from verse seven. What shall we say then? Is the law... Sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the 
law. For I would have not known covetousness or what? Does somebody have a lust? Except the law said you shall not covet. See, covet I think is the better word there in that verse rather than lust. Even though the words are essentially the same. And I'll tell you why I think covet is better. Because Paul is making a reference to the Ten Commandments. And I've never seen, I've never, and look, I know this doesn't mean anything, but I've never seen a list of the Ten Commandments that says, Thou shalt not lust. <laughs> it always says, Thou shalt not covet. Right? And this is important. Not, not, that, not that lust is a bad rendering. I mean, the fact that Paul makes a direct reference to the law that says, Thou shalt not covet. Now, uh, well, let's just go. Let's just go through this these notes, and I want to tell you why this this text is so important in our modern religious thinking. All right, Second Corinthians three seven to eighteen, notwithstanding, which by the way, Second Corinthians three seven to eighteen is my go to text on why we don't follow the Ten Commandments. I, you know, I tell y'all all the time. You need a go-to text in your head. You know, with, with regard to about eight or ten subjects, you need one verse in your head that when somebody brings up a subject, that verse is at the ready. All right? For example, you know, some people might use Mark 16, 16 or Acts 2, 38 as their baptism go-to verse. I don't, use the, I don't use those two verses as my go-to verses. I use Romans 6, 3 to 7. You know, talking about being buried in baptism, raised in newness of life. He who is dead is freed from sin. And the reason I use that text is because there are, there are some arguments that have been formulated against those two texts. So why would I use an argument, you know, why would I use a text that somebody might have an argument in their head when I can use another text that, that, that is so plain that nobody can get around it? See what I mean? And so 2 Corinthians 3, 7 to 18 is my go-to Ten Commandments are no longer valid text. But if I wasn't going to use that text, I would use this one. It's my, it's my next to go-to text. Why is this so important? All right? Because this is, a, is one of the greatest ungetaroundable texts to show the nullification of of the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments in particular. Now, this is why this is why 2 Corinthians 3 and Romans 7 are important in this discussion. And I'll, let me just kind of give you a, kind of a roundabout. You know, a lot of times if we're talking about the Old Testament, right? And somebody say, why don't you follow the Old Testament? We might be inclined to say, our, our, our initial reaction is, the old, the, you know, the, ten, the old law was what? Nailed to the cross. Now, is that right? It is right. It is right. It was nailed to the cross. The problem is, people have arguments formulated against that nailed to the cross text insofar as they'll say, well, the Ten Commandments weren't nailed to the cross. Just the other 603 ordinances are, were nailed to the cross. They'll say, the Ten Commandments are forever, and only the ordinances. You know, there's 613 laws in the old law. There's the first ten, and then 603 more. And people say only the 603 were nailed to the cross. The ten are forever. And I know Johnny knows that because he worked... <laughs> with a bunch of Sabbatarians, and that's their argument. <laughs> By the way, almost every one of your religious friends and neighbors thinks the Ten Commandments are still, still valid. Almost all of them. But they don't hold any of the other 603 as valid. You see? And so this nailed to the cross argument is not airtight in and of itself. All right? 2 Corinthians 3 is airtight in and of itself. Romans 7, 1 to 7, is airtight in and of itself. And here's why. What have we been talking about in the first four verses? 
A dead what? A dead husband. And that dead husband, the law, which Paul, Paul says the law is as a dead husband, right? The law is a dead husband. And in verse 7, he says, The law said, I wouldn't know, have known sin, except the law said what? Thou shalt not covet. In other words, the dead husband said, Thou shalt not covet. Is that right? If we're talking about the law, and the law is the dead husband, and Paul says the law said thou shalt not covet, then the dead husband is what said thou shalt not covet, right? Now, the only place in the old law where it says thou shalt not covet is in the Ten Commandments. The only place it says thou shalt not covet is in the Ten Commandments. And Paul, so what Paul says is, whatever part of the law that says thou shalt not covet is a part of that dead husband. And so therefore we know, in other words, it's airtight. There ain't no getting around it. Whatever part that says thou shalt not covet is part of that dead husband. So therefore thou shalt not covet is done away with. Which means the Ten Commandments are done away with. Now, just very quickly, somebody say, Oh, well, if you think that, since you think the Ten Commandments are, are done away with, then you think you can murder and commit adultery and covet your wife, covet your neighbor's wife and, and I mean, have you ever heard anybody say that? I've heard that more times than I care to remember. So if you think the Ten Commandments are done, then you can do all the things that are forbidden in the Ten Commandments. No, it's not what I said. I said the Ten Commandments are, are dead. For example, does the New Testament not have anything to say about adultery? Does the New Testament not have to say anything to say about bearing false witness? Does the New Testament not have anything to say about murder? Does the New Testament not have anything to say about honoring your father and mother? You see, it's not that I think that the old law being done away with frees me to do those things. I'm under a law, I'm under a law now that's far more strict than that one. Is that true? Is the New Testament more strict than the old one? Some of you, uh, I, let me, I, huh? Some things for sure. Because in order to be an adulterer under the Old Testament, what did you have to do? You had to commit adultery. But to be an adulterer under the New Testament, what do you got to do? Think about it. Isn't that right? Isn't that what Jesus said in the very first sermon we have recorded out of his mouth? Whoso looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Yeah. Now, what'd you have to do to be a murderer in the Old Testament? Hey, kill somebody, right? But what'd John say? He who hates his brother is a murderer. 1 John 3, 15. He who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in it. Yeah, but what did Jesus say about it? You know, we just, again, right before he talked about adultery, he said, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder. But I say to you, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of the judgment. You see? So there's a lot of ways in which the law that we're under now is far more difficult than the old law. So being freed from the old law doesn't mean I'm free to do everything that, that it forbid because I've got a different law now that, that holds me to a far higher standard. So again, when you, when you talk about these things, be prepared, be prepared for these foolish retorts and just direct people, you know, to, well, you think you can do this? I say, well, does the New Testament not have anything to say about that? You know, just, you just run down the list. All right? So, um, and I, well, I've already run through a, the, the letters, a, a, just getting started, like, in letter A, Paul said he would not know covetous except the... Law said, you shall not covet. Where is the phrase, thou shalt not covet, found in the Old Testament? 
in the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20. And I just gave you the answer, letter C. What's this section of called? The Ten Commandments. Should, where is it found should be Exodus 20 and, and the appropriate verse. And then this section of text is commonly called the Ten Commandments. And then letter D, under number 6, it's at the top of page 3. You know, is the text quoted in Romans 7 and verse 7 part of what is dead? It is. So what then can we conclude about the Decalogue, which is a short way of saying Ten Commandments? Dead. That's right. Dead. All right, now, question 7, which is verse 8. Now look. I'm just going to tell you right now. Verse 8 through the end of the chapter is where this chapter gets really difficult. It's, I mean, look. When I say there's no consensus on what a lot of this means from verse 8 through verse 25, I don't mean, I don't mean that there's two schools of thought and half the people think one thing, and half the people think another thing. <laughs> what I'm telling you is, there's about four schools of thought. And there's some really smart fellers that believe part, you know, the A part. There's a lot of smart people that believe the B explanation. There's a lot of smart people that believe the C explanation. And there's a lot of smart people that believe the D explanation. So when I say there's no consensus, there's a bunch of smart people that are not in agreement as to the meaning of this particular text and some of the things in, in the middle, or in particular. Now, I'm not telling you that to discourage you, okay? What you have to do is, is you have to weigh whatever evidence is in the text and draw your own conclusions. And just remember that whatever conclusion you draw simply has to harmonize with the rest of the New Testament. I mean, we can draw, we can draw differing ideas about various texts. And as long as those ideas don't violate some other portion of Scripture, then we're free to hold those views. You know, for example, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Is it word only or is it a literal indwelling? You know, good brethren on both sides don't agree on that. But neither one of those views, you know, puts one at odds with other texts of Scripture so we can have differing views on that. i never forget Brother Woodson was talking about, uh, man, it's a long time ago. He's talking about uh, some, some uh, he called him a young guy, which means he could have been 50. Uh, you know, but he uh, had sent him an article on some certain subject. And he says, and I read the article, and I studied it, and, he, and here's what he said. He says, I didn't agree with it, but it did no violence to the text. In other words, I don't agree with his conclusions, but his conclusions are not in direct violation to some other text, so therefore, Woodson says, he's free to hold that conclusion. You see? And so as we walk through some of this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the best that I've got. In other words, I'm going to give you, I mean, obviously I wrote this material, so I'm going to do my best to give you my conclusions. And just understand, my conclusions are not firm. Let me give you a quick example. I used Cottrell, Lard, Whiteside, and moo, all right, on, on in Romans primarily. Three of those guys are Christians. I mean, the three, the, not, look, those three guys are dead, all right, but they were all Christians. Moo is not a Christian in the New Testament sense of the, of the word. But my point is, sometimes Cottrell agrees with Lord, Moses Lord, on a text, but then three verses later, he disagrees with Lord and agrees with Moo. You see? So these are all good men. They're studied men. So we're going to walk through this and just try to draw the best conclusion that we can draw. All right? And so 
In question 7, which is verse 8. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me uh, all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Apart from the law, sin was dead. Now here we go. Paul starts talking in the first person. I. I. And, and, the, and there, is no, there are four views as to who I is. Is Paul talking literally about himself? Is he talking about himself within a larger context? Is he talking about someone other than himself? All right, and I'm just going to give them to you. Four views. Paul here speaks of himself. Number two, Paul is speaking about uh, of, of Adam. Three, Paul is speaking of Israel, which he would be a part. Four, Paul is speaking of all mankind. Right. The most natural, the most natural is that Paul is speaking of himself. I mean, that's the most natural way to understand it, uh, because he's talking about I all the way through to the end of verse twenty-five. I, I, I tend to think Paul's talking about himself, but. In talking about himself, he's also describing the struggles that every single one of us have. You know, for example, you know, when I preach, and, you know, if I'm preaching and I, and I open up or mention to you about some, some struggle or series of struggle or period of struggle that, I, that I've had, you know, most of the time... Everybody in this audience has experienced maybe not that exact struggle, but what I described fits a form, right? So when I say I and, and, and I go through this, you can relate to it because you've had a similar thing. Does that make sense? So I, I believe that Paul's talking about himself, but he's talking about himself representatively of all Christians. All right? By the way, of those four views, I didn't find anybody that defended the Adam view. <laughs> In fact, I had never even heard of the Adam, that what what might be called the Adam the Adam view, and so uh, and so. Uh, but my point is, there's no consensus as to who Paul's even talking about when he says "I." But the most natural is that he's talking about himself, representing a larger group of people. And then, you know, in this case, says Mu essentially says the same. And I, I cited his commentary. But then Cottrell and Mu differ on the understanding of the law. Cottrell thinks it means any law, whereas Mu thinks he's talking about the law of Moses. Again, see, you see, where, see how difficult this can be? Here's two guys that agree on this, and then we get to the very next point in the verse, and now they, they diverge. But here's the point. It doesn't matter which law you're talking about. The point's all the same. Whether it's any law or the law of Moses, were, you know, before the law, before the gospel came, before the Christian age came, law condemned all of us, Jews and Gentiles. You know, they're all under sin, Romans 3. Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. And sin's a transgression of the law. And the law there doesn't mean the law of Moses. It means God's law. All right? Uh, Moo points out uh, that Paul's intents to show the difficulties created for Israel by the law of Moses. The law gave Israel an understanding of sin, but no remedy for it. You know, Paul said, I would not have known sin except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. So now Paul, Paul has sin brought to his mind, and he understands that he has sinned, but the law of Moses doesn't provide a remedy for it. Because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. Cottrell believes the law under consideration is the law of any kind, be it the law of Moses uh, uh, or the law of the patriarchal age. <laughs> With this view, Lard agrees. Either way, and I lean toward Mu in respect due to the immediate context, the power of sin and death apart from Jesus Christ is what is in full view. All right, so... Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and stop right there because we've already had a bell, right?
Today is the 8th, so it'll be 15th, is that right? 